When you look up at the sun and moon, you see two equally sized, equidistant circles tracing similar paths at similar speeds around a flat, stationary Earth. The experts at NASA, however, claim your common sense, everyday experience is false on all counts. To begin with, they say the Earth is not flat, but a big ball. Not stationary, but spinning around 19 miles per second. They say the sun does not revolve around the earth as it appears, but earth revolves around the sun. The moon, on the other hand, does revolve around the earth, though not east to west as it appears, rather west to east. And the sun is actually 400 times larger than the moon and 400 times farther away. That's right. You can clearly see they are the same size and distance. You can see the earth is flat. You can feel the earth is stationary. But according to the gospel of modern astronomy, you are wrong and a simpleton worthy of endless ridicule if you dare to believe your own eyes and experience. With haughty arrogance, the nearest hypnotized heliocentrist will then inform you that the sun is 865,374 miles in diameter and 92,955,807 miles from the earth. The moon is 2,159 miles in diameter and 238,900 miles from the Earth. And those just happen to be the exact diameters and distances necessary for a viewer from Earth to falsely perceive them as being the same size. So you see, silly flat earther, it is all an illusion, and the apparent equanimity of our day and night luminaries in the sky results from mere coincidental parallax perspective. The sun does not revolve around the earth as it appears. Rather, the earth spins 1,038 miles per hour under your feet and revolves 67,108 miles per hour around the sun. The moon does indeed revolve around the earth, but not as it appears. Though it seems to move east to west, just like the sun and everything else in the heavens, the moon actually spins west to east at 10.3 miles per hour, while orbiting Earth at 2,288 miles per hour, which, combined with Earth's 1,038 mile per hour spin and 67,108 mile per hour orbit around the sun, coincidentally results in all motions perfectly cancelling out making the moon seem to move across the heavens with similar path and similar speed as the sun, while always only showing us one side of its surface and perpetually hiding its dark side. Bernard Brewer said, The moon presented a special math problem for the construction of the heliocentric model. The only way to make the moon fit in with the other assumptions was to reverse its direction from that of what everyone who has ever lived has seen it go. The math model couldn't just stop the moon like it did the sun, that wouldn't work, and it couldn't let it continue to go east to west as we see it go either, at the same speed or at a different speed. The only option was to reverse its observed east to west direction and change its speed from about 64,000 miles an hour to about 2,200 miles an hour. This reversal, along with the change in speed, were unavoidable assumptions that needed to be adopted if the model was to have any chance of mimicking reality. And Marshall Hall said, They want you to believe that the moon's rotation is perfectly synchronized with its orbit, so that's why we only ever see one side of the moon, rather than conclude the obvious, that the moon is simply not rotating. Moreover, they had to slow down the moon's speed by 58,870 miles per hour and reverse its direction to west to east to successfully sell their phony heliocentricity system to a gullible public. I don't think there is one person in many, many thousands, regardless of education, who knows that the Copernican model had to turn the moon's observable direction around and give it a new speed to accommodate the phases and eclipses. William Carpenter said, Astronomers tell us that the moon goes round the Earth in about 28 days. Well, we may see her making her journey round every day if we make use of our eyes, and these are about the best things we have to use. The moon falls behind in her daily motion as compared with that of the sun to the extent of one revolution in the time specified. But that is not making a revolution. Failing to go as fast as other bodies go in one direction does not constitute a going round in the opposite one as the astronomers would have us believe. And since all this absurdity has been rendered necessary for no other purpose than to help other absurdities along, 
it is clear that the astronomers are on the wrong track. There are several theories about the relative size and distance of the sun and moon, all with their points of evidence and points of contention. Flat earthers throughout the ages have used sextants and plane trigonometry attempting to make such calculations, usually concluding the sun and moon both to be only about 32 miles in diameter and less than a few thousand miles from Earth. Perhaps the least plausible model, certainly the most exaggerated and imaginative, is the reigning heliocentric theory claiming the sun to be a whopping 865,374 miles in diameter, 92,955,807 miles from the Earth, and the moon 2,159 miles in diameter, 238,900 miles from the Earth. Heliocentrists' astronomical figures always sound perfectly precise, but they have historically been notorious for regularly and drastically changing them to suit their various models. For instance, in his time, Copernicus calculated the sun's distance from Earth to be 3,391,200 miles. The next century, Johannes Kepler decided it was actually 12,376,800 miles away. Isaac Newton once said, It matters not whether we reckon it 28 or 54 million miles distant, for either would do just as well. How scientific! Benjamin Martin calculated between 81 and 82 million miles. Thomas Dilworth claimed 93,726,900 miles. John Hind stated positively 95,298,260 miles. Benjamin Gould said more than 96 million miles, and Christian Mayer thought it was more than 104 million. Thomas Winship says, As the sun, according to science, may be anything from 3 to 104 million miles away, there is plenty of space to choose from. It is like the showman and the child. You pay your money for various astronomical works, and you take your choice as to what distance you wish the sun to be. If you are a modest person, go in for a few millions, but if you wish to be very scientific and to be mathematically certain of your figures, then I advise you to make your choice somewhere about a hundred millions. You will at least have plenty of space to retreat into should the next calculation be against the figures of your choice. You can always add a few millions to keep up with the times, or take off as many as may be required to adjust the distance to the very latest accurate column of figures. Talk about ridicule. The whole of modern astronomy is like a farcical comedy, full of surprises. One never knows what monstrous or ludicrous absurdity may come forth next. You must not apply the ordinary rules of common sense to astronomical guesswork. No, the thing would fall to pieces if you did. Regiments of figures are paraded with all the learned jargon for which science is famous, but one might as well look at the changing clouds in the sky and seek for certainty there as to expect to get it from the propounders of modern astronomy. But there is no means of testing these ever-changing, never-stable speculations and bringing them to the scrutiny of hard logic and fact. Indeed there is. The distance of the sun can be measured with much precision, the same way as a tree or a house or a church steeple is measured, by plain triangulation. It is the principle on which a house is built, a table made, or a man of war constructed. The sun is always somewhere between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, a distance admitted to be less than 3,000 miles. How, then, can the sun, if it be so many thousands miles in diameter, squeeze itself into a space of about 3,000 miles only? But look at the distance, say the professors. We have already done that, and not one of the wise men we have so often challenged has ever attempted to refute the principle on which we measure the sun's distance. If the navigator neglects to apply the sun's semi-diameter to his observation at sea, he is 16 nautical miles out in calculating the position his ship is in. A minute of arc on the sextant represents a nautical mile, and if the semi-diameter be 16 miles, the diameter is of course 32 miles, and as measured by the sextant, the sun's diameter is 32 minutes of arc, that is, 32 nautical miles in diameter. Let him disprove this who can. If ever disproof is attempted, it will be a literary curiosity well worth framing.
Measuring with sextants and calculating with plain trigonometry, both the sun and moon figure to be only about 32 miles in diameter and approximately 3,000 miles away. The moon is actually a semi-transparent luminary and not the solid, spherical desert planet that NASA would have us believe. In fact, it is likely that both the sun and moon are not densely physical at all and are simply luminous, flat disks able to pass by or through one another during eclipses. E. Eschini said, The results of recent research prove that the heavenly luminaries are not worlds, but lights, and should cause all men who have been led to accept as proven Copernicus's theory of the motions of the earth to reconsider this subject. Gabrielle Henriette said, The satellites of the earth are not masses of matter. They are luminous and transparent disks without substance. The moon, in particular, conveys the impression of being an ethereal manifestation, and the uncertain and elusive character which is usually associated with this satellite results precisely from its immaterial nature. It was recognized from the earliest times that the satellites of the Earth, particularly the sun and the moon, were not solid, opaque bodies. They were first, until Aristotle, considered to be souls or spirits, which does not imply a physical nature. To the ancients, they were simply lights, and they gave the sun and the moon a very apt name. They called them luminaries. In the flat earth model, the sun and moon luminaries revolve around the earth once every 24 hours for the sun, and approximately 25 hours for the moon, illuminating like spotlights the areas over which they pass. The sun's annual journey from tropic to tropic, solstice to solstice, is what determines the length and character of days, nights, and seasons. This is why equatorial regions experience almost year-round summer and heat, while higher latitudes north and especially south experience more distinct seasons with harsh winters. The heliocentric model claims seasons change based on the ball Earth's alleged axial tilt and elliptical orbit around the sun. Their flawed current model even places us closest to the sun, 91,400,000 miles, in January, when it is actually winter, and farthest from the sun, 94,500,000 miles in July, when it's actually summer throughout much of the Earth. They say due to the ball Earth's tilt, different places receive different amounts of direct sunlight, and that is what produces the seasonal and temperature changes. This makes little sense, however, because if the sun's heat travels over 90 million miles to reach the ball Earth, how could a slight tilt, a mere few thousand miles maximum, negate the sun's 90 million mile journey, giving us simultaneous tropical summers and Antarctic winters? Thomas Winship said, The Earth is a stretched out structure which diverges from the central north in all directions towards the south. The equator, being midway between the north center and the southern circumference, divides the course of the sun into north and south declination. The longest circle around the world, which the sun makes, is when it has reached its greatest southern declination. Gradually going northwards, the circle is contracted. In about three months after, the southern extremity of its path has been reached. The sun makes a circle around the equator. Still pursuing a northerly course as it goes round and above the world, in another three months, the greatest northern declination is reached, when the sun again begins to go towards the south. In north latitudes, when the sun is going north, it rises earlier each day, is higher at noon, and sets later, while in southern latitudes, at the same time, the sun, as a matter of course, rises later, reaches a lesser altitude at noon, and sets earlier. In northern latitudes, during the southern summer, say from September to December, the sun rises later each day, is lower at noon, and sets earlier, while in the south, he rises earlier, reaches a higher altitude at noon, and sets later each day. This movement round the earth daily is the cause of the alternations of day and night, while his northerly and southerly courses produce the seasons. When the sun is south of the equator, it is summer in the south and winter in the north, and vice versa. The fact of the alternation of the seasons flatly contradicts the Newtonian delusion that the Earth revolves in an orbit around the Sun. It is said that summer is caused by the Earth being nearest the Sun, and winter by its being farthest from the Sun. But if the reader will follow the argument in any textbook, 
he will see that according to the theory, when the earth is nearest the sun, there must be summer in both northern and southern latitudes, and in like manner, when it is farthest from the sun, it must be winter all over the earth at the same time, because the whole of the globe earth would then be farthest from the sun. In short, it is impossible to account for the recurrence of seasons on the assumption that the earth is globular and that it revolves in an orbit around the sun. Gabrielle Henriette said, The essential feature of the year is its division into two equal periods of six months, based first on the predominating length of the days over that of the nights, and vice versa, conditions which are governed by the varying hours of sunrise and sunset and secondly, by the either high or low height reached by the sun in the heavens at midday. The first cycle, during which the days are longer than the nights, and the sun reaches its culminating point of the year, extends from the spring equinox to the autumn equinox, i.e. March 21st to September 22nd, and the second cycle, during which, inversely, the duration of the nights exceeds that of the days, and the sun descends to its lowest point of the year, extends from the autumn equinox to the spring equinox, i.e. September 23rd to March 20th. These two six-month periods are also characterized by an opposition of temperature. During the first cycle, which corresponds to spring and summer, the heat gradually rises and falls, while during the second cycle, which comprises autumn and winter, it is the intensity of the cold which progressively increases and decreases. In the flat earth model, the sun and moon spotlights are perpetually hovering over and parallel to the surface of the earth. From our vantage point, due to the law of perspective, the day and night luminaries appear to rise up the eastern horizon, curve peaking high overhead, and then sink below the western horizon. They do not escape to the underside of the flat earth, as one might imagine, but rather rotate concentric clockwise circles around the circumference from tropic to tropic. The appearance of rising, peaking, and setting is due to the common law of perspective, where tall objects appear high overhead when nearby, but at a distance gradually lower towards the vanishing point. Samuel Robotham said, Although the sun is at all times above and parallel to the earth's surface, he appears to ascend the firmament from morning until noon, and to descend and sink below the horizon at evening. This arises from a simple and everywhere visible law of perspective. A flock of birds, when passing over a flat or marshy country, always appears to descend as it recedes, and if the flock is extensive, the first bird appears lower or nearer to the horizon than the last. The farthest light in a row of lamps appears the lowest, although each one has the same altitude. Bearing these phenomena in mind, it will easily be seen how the sun, although always parallel to the surface of the earth, must appear to ascend when approaching and descend after leaving the meridian or noonday position. What can be more common than the observation that, standing at one end of a long row of lamp posts, those nearest to us seem to be the highest, and those farthest away the lowest, whilst as we move along towards the opposite end of the series, those which we approach seem to get higher, and those we are leaving behind appear to gradually become lower. It is an ordinary effect of perspective for an object to appear lower and lower as the observer goes farther and farther away from it. Let anyone try the experiment of looking at a lighthouse, church spire, monument, gas lamp, or other elevated object from a distance of only a few yards and notice the angle at which it is observed. On going farther away, the angle under which it is seen will diminish and the object will appear lower and lower as the distance of the observer increases until, at a certain point, the line of sight to the object and the apparently uprising surface of the earth upon or over which it stands will converge to the angle which constitutes the vanishing point, or the horizon, beyond which it will be invisible. Heliocentrist would have you believe the very opposite of what every human who has ever walked the earth has seen with their own eyes. It is obvious to any child and sovereign-minded adult that the sun, moon, stars, and planets Every light in the sky above revolves around the motionless earth beneath our feet. It is also plain to see that the sun and moon are both approximately the same size and situated relatively close to earth, not 400 times divergent and millions upon millions of miles away. 
to abandon your senses and everyday experience in favor of such unfounded science fiction fantasies is a fallacy of appeal to authority so extreme that it leaves the brainwashed believer impotent to trust his own natural instincts and forever thereafter chained to the fantastical explanations of astronomical charlatans. Thomas Winship said, no one ever yet felt or saw the earth careening through space at the terrific rates it is credited with, but everyone who is not blind can see the sun move. But the matter can be tested. It may be known for certain whether the sun moves or not. Take a school globe and place a style on the semicircle that holds it in position. Cause the globe to rotate against a lamp on a table, and you will find that the shadow left on the globe is always parallel to the equator, at whatever angle you may incline the globe. Further, let the style be of sufficient length to allow the shadow to fall on a flat surface, moving the globe towards the lamp, and the shadow will be a straight line. If, therefore, the shadow left on the earth by the sun be a straight line, then undoubtedly the sun is stationary. Drive a stake into the ground in such a position as to expose it to the sun for the greater part of a day, the whole day if possible. Mark the end of the shadow every quarter of an hour and you will find that the marks form part of an elongated curve clearly proving that the sun moves over a stationary earth. And David Ward Scott said, The path of the sun is concentric, expanding and contracting daily for six months alternately. This is easily proved by fixing a rod, say, at noon on the 21st of December, so that on looking along it, the line of vision will touch the lower edge of the sun. This line of sight will continue for several days pretty much the same, but on the ninth or tenth day, it will be found that the rod will have to be moved considerably toward the zenith in order to touch the lower edge of the sun, and every day afterwards it will have to be raised till the 22nd of June. Then there will be a little change for a few days, as before, but day by day afterward the rod will have to be lowered till the 21st of December, when the sun is farthest from the northern center and it is dark there. This expansion and contraction of the sun's path continues every year and is termed the northern and southern declination, and should demonstrate to modern astronomers the absurdity of calling the world a planet, as it remains stationary while the sun continues circling round the heavens.